Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can use XUnit in .NET to write unit tests. XUnit is probably the most popular unit testing framework currently being used even by Microsoft themselves. So that's why I'm going to show that first, but of course in a future video we're also going to take a look at any unit. Potentially MS test as well, even though I don't think many people use it nowadays. I'm going to show you everything you need to know for XUnit to start now writing unit tests and know exactly what you need to use in which cases and how XUnit works out of the box. Just before I move into the code, I want to remind you that until the 1st of February 2020, I am running a giveaway in collaboration with JetBrains, giving away five one-year free ride licenses. Rider is the ID I'm using in my videos and I can highly recommend it. If you want to enter the giveaway, just click the link in the description and follow the steps, which mainly include being subscribed and ringing the sub notification bell. This video is part of my Essential NuGet Package series, so if you don't want to miss any episodes, make sure you subscribe and ring the sub notification bell to be notified when I upload a new episode. So here I have a very simple XUnit tutorial uh, project, and the only packages that I have installed are the following. I'm using the XUnit version 2.4.1, xunit.runner.visualstudio 2.4.1, and then the microsoft.net.test.sdk. And that's all we need to start developing. I have also created two classes. One is a calculator class, which contains some basic functions like add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And the other class is a GUID generator that creates a random GUID using one of its properties. I'm going to use this class in this video to show you exactly how XUnit works in all the scenarios that you can use it. This video also assumes you know what unit tests are, so I'm not going to be explaining what that is. I do have a TDD tutorial, if you want to check it, you can click the link on the top right corner of your screen right now. So a couple of things about XUnit. First, you should know that it's supported in .NET Core, Framework, UWP and Xamarin, so we cover all the major .NET frameworks. You should also know that XUnit is an iteration over an unit and it tries to fix, in quotes, some of the mistakes that people think any unit has. Something you should know is that XUnit runs the tests by default in parallel, but we can override it and I will show you how that works. So let's just see how you can write a test in XUnit. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class and I'm going to name this class calculator test. So we're going to see how we can actually write just tests for the calculator class. The first thing I will do is I will create a private read-only calculator field called underscore SUT and SUT means system under test so it is what we're actually testing right now and then I'm going to make a constructor and I'm going to initialize that field using a new calculator and this is what I'm going to be testing. So in order to write a simple test and in this scenario will be probably just a simple addition we have to create a public void and you can also have a public async task if you're using the async approach. Uh, in this scenario we're doing this all synchronously so I will just say a void and I will say add to numbers should equal their equal. Yeah I mean questionable naming but it describes what this test does. And what you need to do for this to be recognized as a test by uh, the ID and actually I can pull here the uh, runner and I can move it to the right so you can see it clearly. So here I will have my tests when discovered. And what I need to do is I need to add the fact attribute and the moment I add it you can see that it is now recognized as a test and I can actually just right click and run it. It will now pass because there is nothing that can actually make it fail. So what I will do is I will actually write some code. So what I want to do is I want to say sut.add and I'm going to add 5 and then uh, I will add something again. So probably an 8 and I'm going to say at the end assert.equal and what I want is the expected number which in this scenario is 13 and I want to check what is the actual number which is in the calculator as the value property. And now my test should pass when I run it. So this is how you write a very basic test. And you can see here that the test has actually passed. Now this is testing two very specific things. It's testing the 5 and the 8 number. But what if I want to have more complicated scenarios like negatives? Well you might say just copy that, create another test, change the name like 2 
and then make this minus 3 for example and these 3 and say that I'm expecting 0 so here we go we have two tests I'm running again all the tests and they should now pass but this is cluttering our class because the only thing that changes isn't the code but just the parameters so how do we parameterize a test in a way that we can have multiple cases with a single code base well if I delete that and I copy and create a new one I will just delete the fact attribute and I'm gonna say at the end theory uh, I, I should know here that the names I'm using are not the names I would actually use to name those tests but I want you to be able to recognize the difference between the tests that why that's why I'm adding this theory at the end or my, I might add fact or ignored stuff like that so what I want is this method to have two parameters one is in fact it's returning a decimal and let me just create a new line so one will be the expected so I am expecting this to return this number and then what I want to do is I want to have two, two decimals first to add and potentially just another one called second to add I should know at this point that these tests when I run them they run completely in parallel by default and they do not affect each other because each test is running on its own instance of this class so the calculator won't be reused for both tests if you want to do that I will show you later in this video so stick around so we have that here and we have our three parameters now how do we make this run for different amounts of numbers and in fact let me just change this to be first to add and second to add and expect it here so here's our very generic code that should work with multiple values well first you need to add the theory attribute and now you will see that this is not compiling because theory methods must have test data how do we do that well what we're gonna do in this scenario is we're gonna use the inline data attribute and we're gonna say the exact same test case as above expected 13 and add 5 and add 8 but then I'm gonna copy that and I'm gonna do the zero thing so I'm gonna say 0 minus 3 and when I add minus 3 and 3 they should make 0 and again a third one I can just say a hundred and then I have 45 and 50 you can have as many as you want and as many test cases uh, actually this is redundant but I could say that when I add 0 and 0 it should return 0 that might be a good test to have so now you will see when I run this that I will have one test here and three nested tests here and as you can see if I click expand these tests are treated as separate tests here so I am having three tests running with a single code base which is great now you might say what if I want to skip a test for a specific reason I don't want it to be running in this specific running of my code maybe it's broken maybe I need to push a CI build and I don't want CI to fail because of the test well all you need to do is you need to use uh, in the fact attribute or the theory fact attribute you need to use the skip property and you need to set a reason for the skip so I can say here this test is broken and if I save and I run my tests again you will see now that this test will be marked as ignored and as you can see it, all, it also gives us the reason why this is ignored this test is broken so this is how you skip a test in XUnit the next thing I want to show you is how you can actually have more complicated data as parameters because as your complexity becomes well more complex you might want to have different things not just numbers here or a list of many different things you want to test against and you don't want your attributes to have 10 or 15 different inline data so what do you do let's say for example that we have a public static i enumerable of object and the reason why I'm creating this is because I want to create test data so I'm going to say test data here and then let me just import that and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say yield return and I'm going to return a new object array which has in a similar fashion the expected so I'm going to say 15 but then it accepts an array of parameters and this means that I can have an infinite amount of numbers well technically it's not infinite but 
in theory, a, an unlimited amount of different numbers I want to add or subtract from each other. So I'm going to create an array of uh, decimal here, which is the decimals I want to add. So a new array of decimal. And then in here, I can put my decimal. So what adds 13 uh, or sorry, 15? Well, it's 10 and also uh, 5 makes 15. But what if I want to have a different type of representation here? I can say 5 plus 5 plus 5 also makes 15. And you can also have multiple other tests here. So in this scenario, you might want to say, okay, how do I make this negative 10? Well, I'm adding negative 30 and 20. And this, this should give me negative 10. And the test I'm going to write for this scenario is uh, very similar to this. But instead of having two numbers, it will have many numbers. And the way I do this is I'm going to remove that and I'm going to say params, stands for parameters, and then decimal, array, and then values to add. And the params will allow the method to accept an infinite amount of decimals. So what I will do then is I will say values to add dot for each, and I'm going to create a for each loop. I'm going to say value. And I do system under test add the value. And how am I using this I enumerable here? Well, it's actually fairly simple. First, we need to use a the theory again. And now we need to say member data, which is another attribute. And I'm going to use the name of the method I will be using, the member I will be using. And this is it. So now if I run my tests, as you can see here, I actually have some failures as well. Uh, the minus uh, 10 did not happen. This might be something related to my code. Let's just debug it and see why this is breaking. It could be very obvious to you, but I cannot see it. So I'm debugging into the code and I'm having minus 10. So my value is minus 10. And then if I, oh, wait a second. Yes, I totally messed up here. Well, this is why you're unit testing. <laughs> So what I want here is this to be my actual outcome. So I move that here and then this should be like this. So now if I run this, this should pass. Assuming, yes, my math is right. So that's totally fine. So as you can see, we have two here, we have three here, and again, we have two here. And you can have as many as you want, as long as they add up to this number. And this is how you use member data, which is essentially an I enumerable in your class to create a single test per row. And you can have as many as you want here, and you can even auto-generate some. Now, what if you don't want to use a method and you want to go, well, I wouldn't call it necessarily the clean way, but if you have a huge amount of data and logic to generate the data, it might be the clean way. So what if you want to use a dedicated class in this scenario? Well, here's where we can actually just use a class data attribute. And the way to do that is first you need to create a public class. I'm just creating it in the same class. Um, so I don't have to create a new one. And I'm going to use this for division data. So I'm going to say division test data goes here. And this class needs to uh, implement the I enumerable interface of object array. And I need to implement the get enumerator methods. I don't need to touch the, sorry, I don't need to touch this one at all. I need to implement this. And this one just returns the data I want. So what I'm going to use is the following data. In similar fashion, I'm going to copy this, uh, which is the yield return. And I'm going to say that I want 30 back. And in order to get 30, I need 60 divided by 20. Well, my math is great. And then I want zero. That's another good test case. And in order to get zero, I need zero divided by, well, really anything. So I'm going to say divided by one. And last but not least, if you divide the same number with each other, they return 1. So I'm going to say 50 divided by 50 should give me 1. And now, because this implements that I enumerable of object array, I can just copy that same method, the member data one. I'm going to name it the divide many numbers. Not should equal, they equal, but dividing many numbers theory. I don't know. It's a bad name for a test, but I'm just going to use it uh, to go through that. Anyway, I'm showing you just the framework. And um, instead of member data, I'm going to use class data, not class data. And I'm going to use the type of 
the class I want to use for uh, X unit to pick it up. So all you need to do is say type of the class, which is the I enumerable of the object array. So running the, those tests now should create an equal amount of nested tests here and they should all pass. And as you can see, divide many numbers theory works like a charm. So these are all the things that you can do, all the basic things that you can do with facts and theories and using member data and class data and also inline data. Now, something I should point out about X unit is that, like I mentioned, all those tests run in parallel. But what if you didn't want to use those tests in parallel? Well, you need to create a new uh, empty class. So I'm going to call it, I don't know, collection behavior override, something like that. And delete everything from that class, even the namespace. And here I need to say assembly. And then, uh, don't do that, collection behavior. And then I need to say disable test parallelization equals true. And this will disable the test from running in parallel. And even though those are very quick tests, if I run them, you might actually see that they run one after the other. Well, you couldn't because my PC is too fast. But if I was adding a, a delay there, you would be able to see it. So this is how you make tests run non in parallel, so sequentially. Uh, also, it is worth pointing out that these tests actually run in parallel because they're not part of the same collection. And now you might say, what are collections? And I'm going to dive into that right now because let me just delete this <laughs> class real quick because XUnit has this cool concept called collections and it allows you to group different tests into smaller, well, collections. Uh, and you can do cool things with it. If, like if you take this outside of a unit testing idea and you go to the acceptance testing or integration testing, you can actually use collections to run many tests using the same context. So what I mean, well, I have the GUI generator here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a GUI generator tests class. I'm going to show you a couple of cool things. The first thing I want to do is rename this class from um, this name to GUI generator tests one. And I'm also going to create in the same class, a second one. So a two. And then in here, I'm going to have again the private read only GUI generator, well called GUI generator. And I'm going to set it in the constructor to a value a new of itself. And I'm also going to use the private read only I test output helper because I want to output some stuff in the console from my tests. And I can just inject this from the constructor. It's a working out of the box in X unit. And then I need to create a single fact, which I'm going to call public void, just, just GUID test one. And you'll see that I'm not really testing for something, but I'm showing you how you can create collections and use the I class feature to reuse the same context in all of your tests. So I have GUI test one here, and I will leave this class empty for now. And I will say GUID equals GUI generator dot random GUID ID. And then I'm going to say output dot right line and then string interpolation. I'm going to say the GUID was and then the GUI text. And I'm going to create another one as well. And I'm going to call this two. And the code will be exactly the same. And why am I doing this? Well, if I run those tests, what do you expect happening from what you've heard until now? What will happen is this test class will be instantiated twice, one for each test, and the GUI I'm expecting to be completely different. So this is F40 and the other one is DDA. So completely different GUIs, which means that these classes were completely independent of each other when it comes to instantiating. But what if I don't want that to be the case? What if I want to reuse the same system under test or even the same context outside of the system under test to keep some data from test to test? Well, what you need to do is you need to implement the I class fixture class, and then you provide your context. In this scenario, for me, it will be the GUI generator itself. And instead of instantiating it in the constructor, this allows me to inject it in the constructor, as you can see here. And now XUnit will see this and will say, okay, I know that this is the context you're expecting. So I'm going to reuse 
this specific instance in all of the tests. And if, in fact, if I just run those tests again, what you should see is now the GUI should be exactly the same. So D42 and D42, which means that this instance injected is reused on every single test. This opens a huge window when it comes to, especially integration testing, that you want to just do something sequentially. And even if you uh, disable uh, the parallel testing, you can do stuff like that. Or if you don't care about parallelization, you can still reuse the same database connection if you want to do some database stuff uh, here. And something I haven't mentioned is that XUnit, as opposed to any unit which is using the setup, and I think it's called teardown attributes to do the setup and the teardown, XUnit doesn't use that. All the initialization should happen in the constructor, that is the pattern, and all the disposal should happen in the dispose method. And let me see if there's, there is not. Okay, so the way to do that is you need to also implement the I disposable interface. And this will add, let me just implement the missing member, it will add the dispose class. And let me just show you how that works. I will just print something. So the class was disposed. And if I run the test again, you will see that first I'm getting the GUID and then the dispose method is called and my class is automatically disposed. So if you want to do any clear down, any deleting of the database stuff, if you use it for that reason, you can do it here. So yeah, with that out of the way, let me just delete this because I don't need it in this scenario. Now, doing this class picture thing for a single class is fine, but in a bigger system or in a bigger testing scenario, you might want to use the same context in multiple test classes. What you need to do for that is first you need to create a collection definition. And how do you do that? I'm going to create a class called public class GUID generator definition or collection definition. This is up to you. And this needs to implement the I collection picture interface. And in here, I'm going to use my context, which in this scenario is the GUID generator. And this will be an empty class. It doesn't have anything. What it does have, though, is the collection definition attribute. And this attribute requires a name. And as you can see, the other uh, parameter in this method is the disabled parallelization. So you can tell that in a system where we're combining many classes, it might be wise to disable parallelization if you want things to happen one after the other. But I'm going to leave it on by default for now. And here I need to specify the name of this collection so XUnit knows which part are of the same collection. So everything with the same name will be run in the same context in the same GUID generation uh, method. Well, using the same GUID generation uh, class, sorry. So in this scenario, it will be GUID generator. So every class that has this as their collection name will use the same shared context. I'm just saying this over and over again because it's very important to understand. And now I don't need the I class picture anymore. I am leaving this here as well though. I am still injecting the GUID generator from the constructor, but now XUnit will figure it out because I'm adding the collection attribute. And of course I need to give it a name and the name has to be what I have in my collection definition. That's how XUnit will know that this is what I'm asking for. And now, just to prove the point, I will do this again, and I'm going to rename this class to 2. And as you can see, of course, I have to change the constructor, obviously. And now I should have two classes, yeah, 1 and 2. But if I run just those two classes now, what I want to see is every single one of them should have the exact same GUID in their print. So if I expand to show you, E98, 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 and E98. Keep in mind, if I delete that, well, first they wouldn't run because they wouldn't know uh, where the uh, injectable is coming from. But if I did remove that and I just initialized here, and let me just quickly do that for the other class as well, then obviously if I run them again, every single one of them will have a different GUID because, as you say, DAD, B9, 
BD3, and so on and so forth. And that's because nothing connects them. They're not sharing the same context. So this is very important to understand in XUnit because this collection attributes and this I collection feature can be a huge time saver when it comes to things like automated integration testing with XUnit, which XUnit is totally capable of. So it's not just for unit testing. Those are all the basics I want to cover in this video. You can find all the code in the description down below. After watching this video, you should be able to create your own unit test with XUnit from scratch because these are all the main features that you need to be aware of. Special thanks to my GitHub sponsors for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well to get notified when I upload a new episode. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.